This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to our special lecture today. It's a great privilege to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. My name is John Witte. I serve as director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion, the sponsor of today's proceedings. Our center is dedicated to studying some of the religious sources and dimensions of cardinal themes at the intersection of law, politics, and society. Working with some 75 faculty from around the campus, the center sponsors advanced research projects and publications, senior fellowships, specialized courses, joint degree programs, clinical internships, and a variety of public forums, such as this one today. We are privileged to offer you today the McDonald Lecture in Christian Jurisprudence. This is a new lecture series that we established last year as part of the work of our Center on Christian Legal Studies. And we are planning to develop two new lecture series in forthcoming years, one on Jewish Legal Studies and a second on Islamic Legal Studies, consistent with those accents in our center's portfolio of projects as well. It's a great privilege for me today to introduce our McDonald lecturer, the great Yale Don Professor Dr. Nicholas Waltersdorf. Dr. Waltersdorf is the Noah Porter Professor of Philosophical Theology at Yale University and a world-class scholar of that subject, as well as political theory, theological ethics, epistemology, aesthetics, and rights theory. Educated at Calvin College and Harvard University, he has graced distinguished lecterns around the world. He has delivered, among many others, the prestigious Wild Lectures at Oxford, the Gifford Lectures at St. Andrews, the Stone Lectures at Princeton, and the Taylor Lectures at Yale. He has published some 200 articles and 20 plus volumes. Among some of his more recent titles, I would commend to you three brilliant Cambridge University Press titles, Divine Discourse, John Locke and the Ethics of Belief, and Thomas Reed and the Story of Epistemology. Professor Waltersdorf has a powerful new title in the making on justice and human rights, forthcoming from Princeton University Press, and it's that title into which he is giving us an advanced peek today in a sterling address entitled, Speaking Up for Rights. Will you please join me with a robust round of applause to welcome to our lectern, Professor Dr. Nicholas Waltersdorf. Uh, thanks, John, for that uh, characteristically over-the-top introduction. <laughs> and I begin by thanking you for honoring me with the invitation to give the McDonald Lecture on Christian Jurisprudence for 2006. The microphone system is okay? When I became aware that in accepting your invitation, I was following immediately in the large footsteps of my good friend and your very distinguished colleague, John Witte, I realized that you had bestowed on me not only an honor, but an, um, an intimidation. I've read his fine lecture from last year. Um, but as they say, where angels fear to tread, fools tread. So um, here goes. I want to use this occasion to speak up for rights, especially though not only natural human rights, and for justice as grounded in rights. Now I realize that speaking up in a law school for rights and for justice as grounded in rights is likely to be carrying coals to Newcastle. I would expect that in a law school, if anywhere, there will be nodding agreement with what I have to say in both senses of the word nodding agreement. But even Newcastle can use an extra coal now and then. Um, and of course, I have in mind a larger audience and readership for this talk than just the faculty and students of this or indeed other law schools. Justice and rights are the most contested part of our repertoire of moral terms and moral concepts, contested not only or even mainly by theorists, but within society generally. Few people oppose talk about responsibility and obligation. Therapists who believe that guilt feelings are a bad thing, philosophers who see no acceptable way of accounting for obligation, that's about it. Um, obviously, lots of people don't pay much attention to their own obligations, 
but few of them declare themselves opposed to obligation talk in general. And so, so too, I would say, with virtue and love, though many care little about either, not many express um, opposition to talking about them. Justice and rights are different. Opposition to rights talk is common. Some of those opposed are also opposed to talking about justice. They connect the two, rights and justice. Others want to pull them apart. Justice is fine. It's talk about rights that's bad. Why this hostility? Let's take a brief survey, start with justice. Large swaths of American Christians are hostile to talk about justice because they believe that in the New Testament, love has supplanted justice, except for retributive justice. Jesus did not teach, they point out, in the second of the two great commandments that we are to treat people justly. He taught that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. In his now classic book, Agape and Eros, published in the early 1930s, the Swedish Lutheran bishop Anders Nygren worked out this idea in rich detail. After interpreting the love ascribed to God in the New Testament and enjoined on us with regard to our fellows as the love of pure impartial benevolence, Nygren declared that what we learn from Jesus' words and deeds is, and now I want to quote him, what we learn from Jesus' words and deeds is, quote, that where such spontaneous love and generosity are found, the order of justice is obsolete and invalidated. Now this particular attack on justice, coming as it does from within my own religious community, Christian community, is not one that I can ignore. Most secular ac academics are inclined not to give it the time of day. I think that's a mistake on their part. Americans continue to be a religious people, dominantly Christian. And I think we must expect consequences for our culture and society as a whole if many among us believe that justice is outmoded. And in any case, similar things are being said by secular writers, albeit for somewhat different reasons. In her essay, The Need for More Than Justice, for example, uh, the philosopher Annette Beyer argues that though justice may still have a place in human life, it has to be supplemented with virtues less cold and calculating. Care, she says, and I'm quoting her, care is the new buzzword, a felt concern for the good of others and for community with them. The cold, jealous virtue of justice, that's a quote from David Hume, the cold, jealous virtue of justice, says Beyer, is found to be too cold and it is warmer, more communitarian virtues and social ideals that are being called in to supplement it. Barry goes on to explain that the ethics of care is a challenge, quote, to the individualism of the Western tradition, to the fairly entrenched belief in the possibility and desirability of each person pursuing his own good in his own way, constrained only by a minimal formal common good, namely a working legal apparatus that enforces contracts and protects individuals from undue interference with each other. One of the problems with the ethics of justice, she says, is that the rules of justice, and again I quote, at least as, at least as understood in a liberal sense, do little to protect the young or the dying or the starving or any of the relatively powerless against neglect or to ensure an education that will form persons to be capable of perform conforming to an ethics of care and responsibility the end of the quotate from, quotation from Annette Beyer. Others on the contemporary scene are opposed not so much to talk about justice as to talk about rights. This opposition is for a variety of reasons. Some oppose rights talk because they find, I have a brother-in-law who lives in this city of this sort, who find so many rights talk silly that they think it best to purge our vocabulary of all such talk. I agree with the diagnosis, but not with the proposed cure. Many rights claims are, I concede, silly. The UN Declaration on Human Rights, by and large an admirable document, declares in Article 24 that everybody has a right to periodic vacations with pay. Now many people don't work for pay. Some, such as children and the handicapped, don't work at all. Others work, but not for pay. 
farmers, housewives, and the like. So how could everybody have a right to a periodic vacation with pay? I can see that claims like this give rights a bad name. Others are opposed to rights talk for political reasons. All the great social protest movements of the 20th century in the West have employed the language of rights. They've employed other languages as well, but the language of rights was, this is my impression, prominent in the vocabulary of all of them because overall it proved the most useful, most powerful. I have in mind the movements of protest against the position assigned in society to children, to women, to Jews, to African Americans, to homosexuals. And I've also got in mind the um, protests against the Afrikaner regime in South Africa, the communist regimes in Hungary and Poland, and so forth. It was these movements that have made common coinage of such phrases as children's rights, women's rights, civil rights, human rights, and so forth. Now one way to defend disagreement with one or another of these social protest movements would be to insist that members of the group in question don't have the rights that are being claimed for them. Children don't have a right to be kept out of the labor force until they are of age. Women don't have a right to vote. Jews don't have a right to be treated equally in the academy. South African blacks and coloreds don't have a right to equal treatment, and so forth. But very often, defenders of the status quo find the whole discourse of rights menacing. So what they do instead is try to change the vocabulary of the debate. Instead of talking about rights, they say, let's talk about responsibilities, about the social bonds of friendship and loyalty, about what's necessary for a community and a well-ordered society and the like. And then there are those who oppo are opposed to rights talk for what can maybe best be called social reasons. They charge that rights talk expresses and encourages one of the most pervasive and malignant diseases of modern society, possessive individualism. In using such talk, it said, one places oneself at the center of the moral universe, focusing on one's own entitlements to the neglect of one's obligations to others and the cultivation of those other directed virtues that are indispensable to the flourishing of our lives together. The prevalence of rights talk, so it is said, obscures from us our responsibilities to each other and to our communities, obscures from us the singular importance of love, care, friendship, and the like. It demotes the giving self and promotes the grasping self, demotes the humble self and promotes the haughty self. It both encourages and is encouraged by the possessive atomism of the capitalist economy and the liberal polity. It invites us to think of ourselves as sovereign individuals. Wright's talk, continuing the point, is said to be for the purpose of me claiming my possessions, you claiming your possessions, him claiming his possessions. That's what it's for, it said. Claiming one's possessions, giving vent to one's possessiveness, each against the other. Possessive individualists, it said, are not abusing an innocent language by resting it to their evil purposes. They're using it as it was meant to be used. Wright's talk is inherently individualistic and possessive. The theologian Stanley Hauerwas puts it like this in one of his essays. He says, the language of rights tends towards individualistic accounts of society and underwrites a view of human relations as exchanges rather than as cooperative endeavors. Contemporary political theory has tended to concentrate on the language of rights, not because we have a vision of the good community, but because we don't. As a result, we have tried to underwrite the view that a good society is one where everybody is to be left alone rather than one that tries to secure the kind of cooperation that gives one a sense of contributing to a worthy human enterprise. So far, Howard was. And then lastly, there are the objections coming from philosophers and others among the intelligentsia. Talk about rights is nonsense, said Jeremy Bentham, and talk about nat natural rights is nonsense upon stilts. Um, the way to respond to this chart is pretty obvious. Develop an account of rights that makes sense. Now, it's my um, judgment, it's my judgment that some of these objections, probably all, uh, probably most, but not all, 
rest on a mistaken understanding of what rights actually are. So the way to begin a defense against this fusillade of objections is to make clear what it is that we're talking about. Now I got to apologize in advance for the schematic and dogmatic quality of what follows. I hope that my description of what I take rights to be will have for you some degree of intuitive plausibility. But on this occasion, I'm not going to be able to defend and elaborate my description. I do that in the overlong, not yet published book that uh, Woody was mentioning, Justice as Rights. So here's how I understand rights. Rights are normative social relationships, normative social relationships. Sociality is built into the essence of rights. A right is always a right with regard to somebody. In the limiting case, that someone is oneself, I admit. One is, as it were, other to oneself. But usually the other in question is somebody other than oneself. Rights are toward the other, with regard to the other. Rights are normative bonds between oneself and the other. And for the most part, those normative bonds of oneself to the other are not generated, generated by any act of will or intention on one's own part. The bond is there already, antecedent to one's own will, binding oneself and the other together. The other comes into my presence, already standing in this normative bond with me. And this normative bond, as I see it, is in the form of the other bearing a legitimate claim on me as to how I treat her. A legitimate claim on my doing certain things to her and refraining from doing other things. If I fail to do the former things, I violate this normative bond. If I do not refrain from doing the latter things, I also violate the bond. I don't break the normative bond. That still holds. She continues to have that legitimate claim on to me, on me as to how I treat her, but I violate the bond. The legitimate claim against me by the other is a claim to my enhancing her well-being in certain ways, enhancing the good in her life. The action or inaction on my part to which the other has a right against me is an action or inaction that would be or would produce a good in her life. A common apothem in present day political liberalism is that the right has priority over the good. In the order of concepts, it's the other way around. The good has priority over the right because one's rights are rights to goods in one's life. And the converse does not hold. There are many things that are or would be goods in one's life to which one does not have a right. I think it would be a great good in my life if Rembrandt's wonderful painting, The Jewish Bride, were hanging on my living room wall. Sad to say, I don't have a right to that good. I furthermore hold that it, that it is on account of her worth that the other comes into my presence bearing legitimate claims against me as to how I treat her. The rights of the other against me are actions and restraints from action that due respect for her worth requires of me. I fail to treat her as she has a right to my, to, to fail to treat her as she has a right to my treating her is to, is to demean her, to treat her, her as if she had less worth than she does, to spy on her for prurient reasons, to insult her, to torture her, to badmouth her, is to demean her. And to demean her is to wrong her. If I fail to treat her in the way she has a right to my treating her, I am guilty, but she is wronged. My moral condition is that of being guilty. Her moral condition is that of having been wronged. And lastly, 
Rights are boundary markers for our pursuit of life goods, for our pursuit of well-being. I am never to enhance the good in someone's life, my own or that of another's, or that of many others, at the cost of wronging somebody or other, depriving her of that to which she has a right. I am never to pursue life goods at the cost of demeaning somebody. Rights have been described, and correctly so in my judgment, as trumps. It may be that a whole wide range of life goods are to be achieved by some course of action. But if in pursuing that course of action, one deprives somebody of some good to which he or she has a right, thereby wronging them, one is not to pursue that array of goods. That good to which she has a right trumps all the other goods. Now as I see it, the language of rights is for talking about these matters, is for talking about these normative social bonds, is for talking about the fact that sometimes, by not enhancing the well-being of the other, I fail to give her due respect. It is for talking about that curious and sometimes perplexing interaction within the realm of the good between the worth of the other person, on the one hand, and the worth of goods, of goods in her life and the lives of others. The normative social bonds of rights are foundational to human community. I don't only mean, though I certainly do mean, that honoring these, bond, honoring these bonds is foundational to human community. I mean that rights themselves, as I see it, are foundational to human community. I've argued elsewhere, and won't do so on this occasion, that speech is a speech, the performance of uh, acts of assertion and interrogation and so forth, of command, question, promise. That speech is a normative social engagement. Causality, I think, is not sufficient for explaining how it is that by making certain sounds or inscribing certain black marks on white pages, one makes an assertion, asks a question, issues a request, and so forth. I think one has to explain, uh, appeal to rights in order to explain this phenomenon. But of course, without speech, human community is impossible. <laughs> Um, I warned you in advance that I'd only be skimming the surface in quasi-dogmatic fashion, describing how I understand rights with offering, without offering a defense of that understanding or much of an articulation of it. Everything I've said and will, will be going to say merits elaboration and defense. <coughs> but already a question jumps out. If this is what rights are, how did they get such a bad name? They sound pretty good. How do they acquire their bad reputation? Why are so many people so hostile for so many different reasons to talking about rights? Well, it's easy to see why those who oppose social protest movements prefer that the, the debate not be conducted in terms of rights. The rights of the other person, as I've suggested, place limits on how I treat her, not even for reasons of great good to be achieved am I permitted to treat her with under respect? And those who, oppo those who oppose liberation movements almost always can claim that some great good will be maintained and some great evil averted if the status quo is preserved. And they don't want to hear about limits on what they're allowed to do to the other in maintaining this status quo. Likewise, those who want to reshape society to fit their social ideals national socialists, communists, and so forth, don't want to hear about the limits that rights are, the boundaries that must not be crossed on pain of violating the worth of the other. That all seems clear enough. But if rights are what I claim they are, normative social bonds, why would anybody connect them with possessive individualism? There's a normative social bond between me and the other whereby the other bears legitimate claims on me as to how I treat her. What connection could there possibly be between that and possessive individualism? 
I think the clue not, lies not in rights themselves, but rather in practices of honoring and dishonoring rights and in claiming rights, not in the rights themselves, but in the claiming or, or um, failing to honor rights. Notice that it's one thing for the other to have a legitimate claim against me. It's another thing for me to honor that legitimate claim. Likewise, it's one thing for me to have a legitimate claim against the other. It's another thing for me to claim that legitimate claim, to engage in the action of insisting that it be honored. Having a legitimate, legitimate claim to police protection is one thing. Going to a meeting of the city council to insist that the police start honoring that claim is another thing. Now imagine, not all that hard, a society inhabited by possessive individualists. What will they do? Each will claim his own rights, claim his own rights, while neglecting to honor, honor or refusing to honor the rights of other people. In no way does this alter the structure of the rights themselves. That structure remains intact and symmetrical. The other still comes into my presence bearing claims against me, and I come into her presence bearing claims against her. It's the practices of honoring and dishonoring, and the practices of claiming rights that have been distorted. But I think it's also worth noting that the language of service and responsibility can be abused, used to express appalling attitudes of domination on the one hand and servility on the other. And while we're on the topic of individualism, let's note that rights talk scarcely has a monopoly on the language of choice for the self-preoccupied individualist. We have all known self-preoccupied people who thought and spoke not at all in terms of rights, entirely in terms of obligation. Their souls were filled to overflowing with their own rectitude or with their own guilt. Offensive or sickly, or sickly self-preoccupation comes in many forms. Sometimes it employs the language of rights, sometimes it employs the language of duty, and sometimes it doesn't use moral language at all. So I've tried to explain in preliminary fashion what rights are and what it is within reality that rights talk brings to speech. But why is it important that rights be brought to speech? The critics point to the abuses of rights talk. I concede the abuses. But rather than concluding that we should abolish rights talk so as to eliminate the abuses, I hold that we should heal rights talk of the abuses because I think something of enormous worth would be lost if we could no longer bring rights and the violation of rights to speech. The critics focus entirely on the abuse of rights talk. They don't ask what would be lost if we tossed it all out. Now, it's not so easy to identify what would be lost, but here's my attempt. I think what would be lost is our ability to bring to speech one of the two fundamental dimensions of the moral order. Call it the recipient dimension, or in the old sense of patient, the patient dimension, the recipient patient dimension. I've come to think that to the moral status of each of us, there are two dimensions that of moral agent and that of moral patient or recipient. When we speak of duty, guilt, benevolence, love, virtue, virtue, rational agency, and the like, we focus on the agent dimension. When we speak of rights and of being wronged, we focus on the recipient dimension. So, I think that to eliminate rights talk, would be to make impossible the coming to speech of the recipient dimension of the moral order. It may be said in reply that rights are the same thing as duties in different words. 
suppose one singles out from the um, agent dimension generally that part thereof which pertains to obligation and sets to the side the parts that pertain to virtue, love, benevolence, rational agency, and all of that, just the obligation dimension. What may be said is that what I'm calling the recipient dimension is nothing more than the obligation dimension of the obligation part of the agent dimension described in different words. Everything that can be said in the language of rights can be said in the language of duty and obligation. Same facts, different words. Nobody supposes that south and north are fundamentally distinct dimensions of space. I'm to the south of you if and only if you're to the north of me. Same thing, different words. Nothing is lost, so the proposal is nothing is lost if we toss out rights talk as long as we keep duty talk. Something would be lost if we tossed out both of them. Now I think that the best way to see that we are dealing here with two distinct dimensions of the moral order, connected of course, not independent, rather than with one dimension differently described, I think the best way is to look at duties and rights from the dark side, from the side of being guilty and from the side of being wronged. One is guilty if one has failed to do what one was obligated to do. One is wronged if one has not been treated as one had a right to be treated. And my guess is that we all have some intuition to the effect that your being guilty and my being wronged are not just the same thing in different words. Maybe the following observation will strengthen this intuition. Suppose that in treating me a certain way, you have violated your obligation toward me, and that correlatively, I have been deprived of my right against you to your not treating me that way. You are guilty, I am wronged. Now suppose that you are absolved of your guilt, of your guilt. Perhaps you go to a priest, confess your sin, and he absolves you. I'm not convinced that absolution for guilt really is a possibility, but let's suppose it is. So you've been absolved. What then is my moral condition? Does your being absolved of your guilt mean that I am now automatically also relieved of having been wronged? Of course not. I am in exactly the same moral condition that I was in before your absolution took place. Absolution, if there is such a thing, deals with guilt. It doesn't deal with being wronged. It's repentance by one party and forgiveness by the other that deals with being wronged, though in a way very different from absolution. When one thinks of what one is doing in terms of obligations, one focuses on the bearing of one's action on actions on one's own moral condition. One is upright or guilty. When one thinks of what one is doing in terms of rights, one focuses on the bearing of one's action on the recipient of what one is doing. Her rights are honored or she is wronged. If one thinks exclusively in terms of obligations, and if furthermore one thinks of guilt as simply guilt for violating the moral law rather than guilt for wronging the other, then the person who has been wronged falls entirely out of view. The language of duty and guilt enables the battered wife to point to the effect of her spouse's actions on his moral condition. He is now guilty. The language of rights and of being wronged enables her to point to the effect of her spouse's action on her own moral condition. She has been wronged, deprived of her right to better treatment, treated as if she were of little worth. He's not only guilty of having acted out of accord with some moral law, he's guilty of having wronged her. The language of duty and guilt enables the oppressed to point to the effect of the oppressor's action on the moral condition of the oppressors. 
the oppressors are now guilty. The language of rights and of being wronged enables the oppressed to bring their own moral condition into the picture. They've been deprived of their right to better treatment, treated as if they were of little worth. The oppressors are guilty of having wronged them. So I think the reason that the language of rights has proved so powerful in social protest movements is that it brings the victims and their moral condition, and not just the agents, into the light of day. In September 1985, a remarkable pamphlet called the Kairos Document was issued by some 150 theologians and church leaders and political leaders in South Africa. In a section of the document, um, in, in what they say about church theology, in a section of the pamphlet that they call Justice, the authors of the Kairos document point to the difference between two the two dimensions of the moral order that I've been calling attention to. They state, they state why those in power prefer to attend only to the agent dimension and why it's important to bring the recipient dimension into the light of day. I'd like to read a little bit of it, which captures, which helps to capture the idea. We should remember that the pamphlet was written before about six, seven years before the overthrow of, overthrow of the apartheid regime in South Africa. Here's what they said. It would be quite wrong to give the impression that church theology in South Africa is not particularly concerned about the need for justice. There have been some very strong and very sincere demands for justice. But the question we need to ask here, the very serious theological question, is what kind of justice? An examination of church statements and pronouncements gives the distinct impression that the justice that is envisaged is the justice of reforms. That is a justice that is determined by the oppressor, by the white minority, and that is offered to the people as a kind of concession. One of our main reasons for drawing this conclusion is the simple fact that almost all church statements and appeals are made to the state or to the white community about their guilt. The general idea appears to be that one must simply appear to the conscience and the goodwill of those who are responsible for injustice in our land. But the problem that we are dealing with here in South Africa is not merely a, a problem of guilt. We cannot just sit back and wait for the oppressor to see the light so that the oppressed can put out their hands and beg for the crumbs of some small reforms. That in itself would be degrading, they say, and oppressive. Now it would be nice uh, if I could uh, move into a concluding peroration at this point and invite your questions but I can't. Um, there are two, pe two groups of people who will find what I say not so much incomplete, they may be willing to wait for my book, but um, fishy. They may not be able on the spot to pinpoint where I've gone astray, but they're absolutely sure that I've gone astray somewhere. One of the two groups that I've got in mind consists of those Christians who hold that love has supplanted justice in the New Testament. The other consists of those who are convinced by a certain narrative concerning the origin of the idea of natural rights. Many of those who belong to the latter group, the narrative group, also belong to the former uh, Christian group. And I think I can't conclude without explaining how I would go about answering these two groups of people who say, well, Walter Storff, we can't exactly identify what you've said wrong, but it's, it, it, it can't be right. Um, more detailed answers once again I give in this yet unpublished book. Let me begin with those who adherence to a certain narrative concerning the origin of the idea of natural rights leads them to find my description of rights fishy. To explain this narrative, I must now connect what I've been saying about rights with how I think of justice. I think of the social order as just insofar as its members enjoy the goods to which they have rights. Some of those rights are generated by actions on the part of human beings, by the issuing of legislation, by the performance of various speech acts, promises, and so forth, and, and the like. But some of the rights are not so generated. The ones not so generated by actions on the part of human beings are natural rights. Natural rights, I hold, are in good measure intrinsic to those who have them. That is to say, 
members of the social order don't have them on account of how they, the members, are related to some norm extrinsic to themselves. They've got them on account of their own worth. And I hold that all rights are ultimately so grounded. I call this way of thinking about justice kind of clumsy, but anyway, justice as intrinsic rights. Now I've come to think that in the Western tradition there's another way of thinking about justice. Justice is right order, I call it. Natural law for the right ordering of society, it said, is what ultimately grounds justice, not the intrinsic rights of members of society. And those who favor this latter conception of justice conduct their, conduct their polemic against the conception I favor almost entirely by means of a narrative and a social critique based on the narrative. Once upon a time, so it is said, everybody who thought about justice thought of, about it in terms of right order. Then individualistic modes of thought arose, and they introduced and employed this idea of natural rights. As such modes of thought became more common, the old way of thinking about justice gradually lost its appeal and was displaced by this alternative conception of justice as grounded in intrinsic rights. So, the story says, individualism is in the DNA, both of the idea of natural rights and of this conception of rights as ultimately grounded in, um, intrinsic, of justice as grounded in intrinsic rights. So there's an inherent connection between, on the one hand, the idea of natural rights and the conception of justice as based on intrinsic rights, and on the other hand, the possessive individualism of modern society. Earlier, I said that the language of rights is susceptible to being bent to the purposes of the possessive individualist. The claim here is that the connection between the language of rights and possessive individualism is essential, not contingent as I presented it as being, but essential. And the story continues both for correctly understanding justice sort of an intellectual matter, and for the health of society. We must recover that older, more venerable way of thinking that was displaced by the justice as intrinsic rights conception. We must rid our thought of the idea that there are natural rights. We've got to recover the idea of justice as right order. If you want some names here, the, the names would be Leo Strauss, Alastair McIntyre, um, Joan O'Donovan, Oliver O'Donovan, as um, Stanley Howard was, is very good examples of the justice's right order way of thinking. <laughs> and what were those individualistic modes of thought that supposedly introduced and employed the idea of natural rights? And hence also introduced the idea of justice as grounded in intrinsic natural rights. Well, some say that the idea of natural rights was introduced by the individualistic political theorists of the Enlightenment. Others in this movement say that it was, that though it was certainly employed by the Enlightenment political theorists, it was in fact introduced way back in the 14th century by that uh, near heretic, William of Ockham, in his defense of his fellow Franciscans against the attacks by uh, Pope John XXII and that Occam's nominalism provided the theoretical framework for his introduction of this idea. Either way, you see, the claim is that the idea of natural rights emerged from individualistic modes of thought and that only within such modes of thought does it have any relevance and utility. Now my reply to this narrative depends almost entirely on the labors of others. That fine scholar of medieval intellectual history of whom many of you know, I've come to realize, Brian Tierney, has now shown us decisively, <laughs> as anything ever does get shown in intellectual history, that this narrative is just plain false. In his superb book, The Idea of Natural Rights, Studies on Natural Rights, Natural Law, and Church Law, 1150 to 1625, Tierney shows decisively that in the mid-12th century, hence two centuries before this wicked fellow, fellow William of Ockham, canon lawyers were employing the concept of natural subjective rights 
in their comments on Gratian's Decretum and in their corresponding discussion of ecclesiastical legal issues and some political issues of the day. Now, I take it nobody would accuse the canon lawyers of the 1100s of being individualists in their thought. My own view is that one finds a recognition of natural rights in various of the church fathers already, some of the relevant passages having been collected there in Gratian's Decretum. And I think, and this is the most provocative part of it all, and I think one finds it back behind the church fathers in the Old Testament. But this is not the occasion for me to offer my counter narrative concerning the archeology span of natural rights. What's relevant to note here is, is just that the evidence points to the conclusion that the concept of natural rights is one of our most ecumenical of concepts. It can be and has been employed by those who think along individualistic lines. It can also be employed and has been employed by those whose thought doesn't carry even a whiff of individualism about it. And last, what about the argument of my fellow Christians that justice has been supplanted by love in the New Testament? Well, a full treatment of this argument would obviously require an interpretation of the relevant New Testament texts. And sorry about this, here too, I must beg off on the occasion of this present lecture. I think what I can do though is show in somewhat a priori fashion why, why this claim cannot be correct. We can see why it cannot be correct by looking at the main argument that Anders Nygren gave for his position an argument that a great many Christian ethicists of the 20th century have found persuasive. It goes like this. One day a lawyer was trying to trap Jesus in his words. I'm not making this up. The New Testament says he was a lawyer and says that he was trying to trap Jesus in his words. One day a lawyer was trying to trap Jesus in his words and asked him, which commandment in the Torah is the greatest? Jesus replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Whatever may have been the trap that the lawyer was trying to set, he didn't succeed in catching Jesus. On another occasion, Jesus was talking to a leader of the Jews, a member of the Pharisee party named Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus, like everybody else who encountered this baffling and unnerving person, Jesus, wanted to know who and what he was, wanted to know his identity. So in the course of answering Nicodemus's question as to who he was, Jesus declared that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Now in those two passages, the English word love occurs, I mean in the English translation, three times. In each case, the Greek word being translated is agape, A-G-A-P-E, agape. The question that gripped Anders Nygren's attention was, what was meant by the agape that the New Testament writers report Jesus as attributing to God and as enjoining on us? And his conclusion was that agape was benevolence, sheer, pure benevolence commitment to advancing the well-being of the other. It is not, he insisted at great length, eros, eros. Now the Greek word eros is also standardly translated into English as love. It's translated that way in Plato's Symposium. Eros is that form of love which consists of being attracted to or by the worth of something. Eros is what Plato talks about in the symposium when he describes the soul as drawn to, attracted by the form beauty itself. Now here is Nygren's argument for his claim that New Testament agape is pure benevolence. The prime example he says of God's love for us, agape, is God's forgiveness of the sinner. But God does not forgive us because God finds us so compellingly worthy and attractive. It's not that God is drawn to us like the people in Plato's Symposium are just drawn to the beautiful itself. So the love manifested in forgiveness cannot be eros. But neither, and this is the part of the argument that's important for my purposes, neither, says, says Nygren, 
Neither does God forgive us because justice requires it. Because in the nature of the case, forgiveness is not something that justice requires. The wrongdoer doesn't have a right to be forgiven. On the contrary, the one who is wronged is within his rights if he subjects the wrongdoer to retribution. So, the divine love manifested in forgiveness has to be sheer benevolence, motivated neither by the worth of the wrongdoer nor by what justice requires. Agape, here's the conclusion of the argument, agape is justice blind. Now let's think about this for a minute. Nygman claims that the New Testament presents God's forgiveness of the sinner as exemplary of God's love, divine love in general. I think he's mistaken about that. God's love does indeed include forgiveness, and forgiveness is benevolence. But God's love as a whole includes, so it seems to me, the love of attraction, eros, and also I would say the love of, a, uh, the love of attachment. Nygman furthermore claims that forgiveness is not required by justice. The wrongdoer is not, forgiven, is not wronged if he's not forgiven. On that, I think he was right. But I think it's mistaken to conclude that forgiveness is, or could be, justice blind. And here's my reason. Note that forgiveness is not something that you can scatter just hither and yon. I cannot forgive some Afghan farmer, known to me only from an article in the New York Times, which reports him as growing opium poppies in violation of law and, I assume, morality. I can only forgive those people who have wronged me, and only for the wrongs they have done me. That is to say, I can only forgive someone for having deprived me of some good to which I had a right, though this may be involved with, uh, indirectly with other people as well. I can only forgive someone for having wreaked injustice on me, because to forgive someone is to forego exercising some or all of the, of the retributive rights that one has on account of their having wronged one. That is, on account of their having deprived one of some of one's primary rights. So, if there were no such thing as violations of justice, of primary justice, there could be no such thing as forgiveness. And if I were oblivious to violations of justice, I would simply never know when justice was possible and wouldn't, wouldn't know when it was relevant. So Nygren's argument that in the New Testament love supplants justice has to be mistaken without even looking at the texts. Yes, it's true that the wrongdoer doesn't have a right to be forgiven. Nonetheless, forgiveness presupposes justice and injustice and presupposes alertness to justice and injustice. Forgiveness cannot be justice blind. It has to be justice alert. And since God's forgiveness, though not exemplary of the totality of God's love, is certainly a prime example of God's love, God's love has to be justice alert. It cannot be justice blind. God's forgiveness transcends justice in such a way that it continues to presuppose it. It does not supplant rights but it takes rights for granted. I close by returning to my main point. The other comes into my presence as a creature of worth. She is created as an icon of God and is loved by God. On account of that worth, along with lots of other modes of worth, she has legitimate claims on me as to how I treat her. If I fail to treat her that way, she's been wronged by me. The language of rights and of justice is for bringing to speech that fundamental dimension of the moral order. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Waltersdorf, for vindicating your sterling reputation for subtlety and for wisdom.
at once in such a compact and beautiful text. Uh, we have some time for uh, questions from the audience. Michael Perry doubtless will have several. Um, Harold Berman will no doubt have a few more, as will Abdu and Naeem, our three great rights theorists in the room, amongst many others. Um, while Professor Perry is sorting out the several questions he will ask, I do want to make note that the wonderful book, The Idea of Natural Rights that Brian, uh, by Brian Tierney that Professor Waltersdorf mentioned, uh, was happily published in our Emory University Studies Law and Religion series, and the guts of that book were presented at this very lecture in, uh, some 12 years ago in a series of lectures that Professor Tierney offered us here. So. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Perry, no doubt you have several questions that well, you can I, put directly to our, <laughs> our sage. I, I, uh, I do have a question for Nick, but I have to work my way up to it. The, uh, first, I want to say God talk and rights talk in one lecture. Who could ask for more than that? <laughs> the two most controverted styles of discourse. Uh, Nick, I don't know whether you've yet had a chance to read Deus Caritas Est. Uh, read what? Uh, Deus Caritas Est. No. Benedict the Saint. But, but I'm told, I'm not familiar with Nigrin, but I'm told that there's uh, significant traces of Nigrin in the piece. So that's something you may want to track down. Uh, I'm also told that you shall treat your neighbor as yourself is better translated from the Greek of the Septuagint as you shall treat your neighbor lovingly for he is like yourself. And I prefer the latter imperative to the former because the former doesn't offer me much, con much consolation if the person to whom it's directed doesn't treat himself very well. Um, so I, whenever I hear that you shall treat your neighbor as yourself, I always think about that alternative articulation. The, um, at, at various points in your talk, you, I, I, you, at one point you talked about violating the bond at another point, you talked about violating the worth of the other. And each time, I wanted to say the, what we should be saying is violating the other. It is the person who is violated. And this gets, brings me closer to my question, because when you said you wanted to tell us what rights are, I wanted to say that what I understand you to be doing is telling us what you mean when you engage in rights talk. And although I'm deeply sympathetic to the substance, well, let, let, let me, to this connected, I'm deeply sympathetic to the substance of what you say, I'm inclined to think that everything that you gain, that, that the natural rights talk in which you engage can be translated without remainder into a language that does not rely on natural rights talk, that relies on violation talk. A woman is raped. You could say that her natural right not to be raped has been violated. I would prefer to say, and that someone has is, is not complied with this duty not to rape her, I would prefer to say that the act of rape violates the woman. You say she's wronged, I say she's violated. You say that somebody has forsaken his duty, I say that he has violated her. He is a violator. So it, it, I, my, this gets me to the, the fundamental part of my comment, which is that I find myself simultaneously drawn to the substance of what you say, but also still very sympathetic to Bentham. Because it, it's not that I, have, that I think there's anything wrong with Wright's talk as long as you specify its meaning the way you do. It'll be a language that I can translate into my language, my discourse of violator, violated, worth of the person. It's just that as a lawyer, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with Bentham, that rights talk can be misleading. That's a cost. Because it, 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 when rights talk in the law is very different from rights talk in morality. And it is those differences that lead me to shy away from it. Obviously, this isn't the time or place to go into this, but these are just some thoughts that I hope will lead to a later, fuller conversation. Um, thank you, Michael. As always, challenging comments. Um, whether I can meet the challenge is another matter. Uh, so I think, I think we cannot dispose of the language of rights and 
and simply make do with the language of violation. Um, in, my, in my mind, I want to distinguish those rights and the ground for the rights is, is uh, inviolability or, or worth or something in that region. So if all we had is the language of rights, what we couldn't do is this. We can talk, with the language of rights, we can talk about the goods to which we have rights. And, and those goods, I think, are goods always to be treated certain ways by one's fellow human beings, or in the limiting case by oneself, for them to do something positive or negative, do something or refrain from doing. So, so Michael, I don't see, if, with the language of, via, of inviolability, you can probably substitute, you can maybe substitute that for my language of honoring worth and dishonoring worth and so forth, which I see as the grounding of rights, but, but you, you, you can't talk about the goods to which we have rights. So, 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 let, so let me, I mean, he's a powerful figure, but, um, but I had him as a student. So John, may he say one more thing in reply? <laughs> What, there, are two, there are two issues. One has to do with the worth of the other. And in the language of human rights, we talk about that worth in terms of inherent dignity. A separate issue it has to do with the normative force, if any, that inherent dignity has for us. The, 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 there's a twofold claim. One, that the other has inherent dignity. And the second part of the claim is that we ought to live our lives accordingly. Namely, we ought to respect that dignity. We ought not to deny that someone has it or treat, it, treat, treat her as if she lacks it. Yeah. Um, the, the problem I have with rights talk is if you say to the person who is raped, to the person who has been the raper, that you have violated her, that, that's a way of saying you have treated her, you have either denied or treated her as if she lacks inherent dignity. If you then say you have violated her right, meaning her natural right, it seems to me that person is entitled to say, uh, come again? If you're saying that she has a right not to be raped, you're saying I have a duty not to rape her, meaning I have reasons not to rape her, we're now suddenly talking about a different set of criteria, the criteria involved in the claim that I should live my life accordingly, that that inherent dignity has a force for me. That takes us off in the direction of what kind of person I should be, and what kind of reasons I have to be that kind of person. So it's, it's, it's complicated, and we've talked about it before, two years ago and yeah, one year ago. Yeah, but I, yeah. I just think there's, a, there's an alternative way of sorting all of this out uh, that, is, that, that leaves intact the substance of what you're concerned with, but that is, forgive me, maybe more nuanced with respect to the various issues involved here. On the one hand, worth. On the other hand, the not-to-be-violatedness of the person, which is a claim about the kind of people we should be. This, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I am now reminded of where you were going. Uh, and uh, you're right, um, getting into that would, would take a long time. I think your way of going is not the right way to go, but <laughs> that's, Michael and I have talked about this for uh, several days and we didn't resolve it, so, you know. <laughs> Yes. I'm not a lawyer or a theologian, but I'm a 10th generation Scottish Presbyterian. I was reading a book recently by Lin Yutang, who made a, a comment which startled me, and then I got to thinking, I'm, maybe he's right. He said, fighting is necessary. And I thought, fighting is necessary. And I thought, well, maybe Jesus would go along with that. Did I hear you right that fighting, fighting is necessary? Um, 
I'm not sure what to say. I don't know what to say to that, but th that Jesus would go along with that. Um, it's going to depend very much on what kind of fighting you've got in mind, what kind of challenging um, we're dealing with. I mean, Jesus is not meek and mild. What comes out of the 19th century romantic tradition is Jesus meek and mild. And when I read the Gospels, well, <laughs> I must confess that the last set of words that come to my mind are meek and mild. Um, it, it's filled with abrasive brace, a of behavior. I mean, one of the most vivid, he gets, he gets invited by a Pharisee to a dinner party at the Pharisee's house on a Saturday, on a, on a Sabbath. He's hardly in the house, and he says, the seating arrangements are all wrong here. Um, people of high social standing have seated themselves next to the host, and people of low social standing have seated themselves way, way off in the door. You, you, sh you, shouldn't, you shouldn't hold dinner parties in which the seating arrangements are like this. A little bit of chatter. And then Jesus says, um, furthermore, you really shouldn't invite people who can pay back your dinner invitations. You should invite people who, who can't pay back their dinner invitations. Now, meek and mild. If, 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 if a guest had behaved like this in my house, um, I won't finish that sentence. I want to go to an easier subject, and that is uh, how can you reconcile the human rights of the Palestinians in the West Bank with the divine right? And in this case, at this point in history, the Christian churches all over America are preaching from pulpits that the land belonged to the Jews. So it's a divine right. How do you reconcile that issue, which is a, a, a very tough issue? Um, so we get into an issue of Old Testament exegesis in that case. Um, I don't think the land does belong to the Jews, and I think the rights of the Palestinians have been systematically violated for the last what are we now, 2006, for the last 50 years. Even, even if you d disagree with whether Israel in 2006 has a right to, the, I mean, lots of things there. there. There are all kinds of different descriptions of the boundary of this land in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible for one thing. It's, it's, some of the descriptions carry it all the way to the Euphrates River and down to the Nile and so forth. Um, but even if you think Israel ha has the right to national sovereignty in this land, even, even, even if you think that, the way the Palestinians have been treated is a deep violation of their natural human rights, of their God-given rights, in my view. If the right to forgiveness or to forgive uh, inheres in the recipient uh, or the victim of the wrong, as, as you have discussed uh, here today, if that is where that right of forgiveness, and, and thus I would assume the right of vengeance or vindication might inhere in that victim, would you comment on what that might tell us about the right of America to, uh, uh, who is essentially a stranger to the relationship between Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi people. What does that tell us, if anything, about the right of America to avenge the wrong uh, or wrongs committed by Hussein upon the Iraqi people? Ah, so... Uh, <laughs> How does all this apply to all the troublesome problems in the world? Well, uh, um, <clears throat> so, so I'll start with the, the part that I feel more sure about and move to the part that I feel less sure about, uh, the forgiveness part. Um, so I think, let me start differently. As I read the documents of Pagan, pagan antiquity, the ethical writings of the ancient Greek and then Roman moralists, they were of the view that when one has been wronged, uh, retribution is a duty, that, that, that the world has to be set right again. And if the world is, 
by, by some kind of equal, and then we get talk about equity, of equality, and so forth, that the world has to be set right again by some sort of equal hard treatment, uh, uh, some sort of hard treatment of the wrongdoer that will be roughly equal to the hard treatment that the wrongdoer uh, imposed on me. I think that um, one has to read the Christian and Hebrew Bible as disagreeing with that fundamental assumption. It's not in general true that punishment is a duty. Um, if you thought it was a duty, then you would think that forgiveness, and, and the Greeks had deep troubles with forgiveness. Uh, Aristotle was basically against it. If you thought that punishment was a duty, then forgiveness is immoral. So I think one gets on that point a strikingly different moral vision between the moral writings of pagan antiquity and those of the uh, Hebrew and Christian Bibles. I think what, what, what the Bible teaches is that punishment is often a permission, retribution is often a permission, but it's not a general, and it may sometimes be a duty, but it's not in general a duty. And that forgiveness then is not consequently a violation of the duty to punish, it's just, it's not, it's just not taking up the permission to punish, it's, it's foregoing punishment. Um, the wrongdoer doesn't have a right to one's foregoing that permission, um, and hence it is that forgiveness is a kind of grace, it's, uh, it's a love. How does that apply to our treatment <laughs> of Saddam Hussein? Um, the international order, well, let me, uh, the international order is, in fact, full of examples in which nations forego retribution for being wrong. They, they find it unwise and, uh, and so forth. So one can't operate international affairs by saying that every wrong's got to be punished or, or it'd be a pretty horrible world that we live in. Um, our engagement with Hussein, I don't know, that's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass. <laughs> I've got profound difficulties with American practice and policy, but, uh, but it's gonna take me a while to uh, lay them out and uh, sounds a little bit wimpy, I realize, but. Final question. Uh, uh, Nick, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, very much drawn to the idea that uh, rights should be understood in terms of existing moral bonds. Uh, and I think this is apart from the possible criticism that, that Michael has raised. But in the, your presentation, it seems to me that there is some ambiguity about what you mean by an existing moral bond that's already there. Um, the examples that you give are, one in which, are ones in which uh, t typically they're is assumed a kind of rough equality between the two. But in fact, rights language is quite at home in traditional forms of society or various hierarchical forms of society where people have mutual rights that do in fact express uh, reciprocal rights, let's put it that way, that do express a moral order between them. Um, and yet they are reciprocal but unequal rights, whether it's the feudal system or one could think of, of many other possibilities, uh, and the relationship between male and female would be a good example of this. And I'm wondering whether part of the both controversial aspect of rights language, but also its potential, is that when it does get raised and is given uh, to speech, uh, that often an existing moral bond, a de jure moral bond, is actually being called into question by virtue of other sets of relationships that have transformed roles and self-perceptions. In other words, it's not just two persons, uh, but when women are claiming rights, it's not that they are claiming a right that they have always had by law, covenant, cultural understanding. It's often a claiming of a right that they're making on the basis of other sets of moral relationships, which can be also very critical, prophetically critical, of the existing moral relationships, so that there are really two ways in which a moral bond can be in place. The one is the existing bond of a culture, legal system, society. The other is what it seems to me you were invoking often, which was a transcendent moral bond, uh, 
either transcend it by virtue of having a religious dimension, whether we could put it in terms of violation, worth, or in terms, more sociologically speaking, the consequence of transformation of self-understanding and roles. Um, yeah, if, if, if I understand your question, John, um, I, I mean to give a, a general account of rights, especially in the book. Now, now today, I suppose I emphasize more natural human rights than general account of rights. But, but um, for for us who work in a university, rights are uh, are in, not just not so much natural human rights, but the rights of accomplishment are part of the fine texture of how the university operates. That if a student writes a first a first rate paper for me. Uh, and is asked first-rate questions in the seminar and so forth, they've got a right to a first-rate grade in the American grading system in A, and if they don't get it, they've been wronged. And that's not some natural human right, it's a, it's a right of accomplishment. Um, I think the appeal to natural, to natural rights is, um, is what often, yeah, I'm not sure I've thought that entirely through, but, but, but the appeal to natural rights is now, I'll say it differently. When, when one thinks that there's something wrong with the practices, with the way rights and duties are understood in some practice, academic practice or, or fa familial practice or how men and women are related in fact, or in business practice, whatever, when one thinks that there's something wrong with practices, often it's not possible to appeal to some super, some super practice or piece of legislation to critique, I mean, sometimes it is, but to critique uh, the lower one, now sometimes you can appeal to a piece of legislation, but often, often the legislation you think is wrong or missing or something like that. So natural rights be becomes, a, be becomes the final court of appeal, which is sort of why it's <laughs> natural in thinking about rights to give it a priority. Though, th though when, I write, when I talk and write about rights in the book, I insist that we start at the bottom, as it were, not with natural human rights. I think it's important to see that they that they pervade the fine texture of our human existence. And those who talk about getting rid of recognition of rights are, are sort of oblivious to that fine texture. I'm not sure that that meets your question very well. Thank you. Well, we are dealing with uh, timeless questions, and I hope that Professor Waltersdorf will come back many times to continue to address them. I want to uh, thank Nick for a sterling address and for this a subtle um, introduction to a rich topic that his book, I think, will lay out in greater detail and which several of his earlier books have also addressed. And I would particularly commend a book called Until Justice and Peace, Until Justice and Peace Embrace, which uh, works through a number of what we would call constitutional rights or international rights uh, dealing with both groups and individuals. Uh, I want to recognize and thank uh, April Bogle, Eliza Ellison, and Janice Wiggins in our shop for their work in putting together this forum. I want to thank uh, Scott Andrews and Corky Gallo in our AV shop for all their hard work. I want to thank all of you in, uh, to come to this forum today. If you uh, have some comments about the forum, if you see a little uh, flyer in your uh, program that you received, fill it out and let us know how we can serve you better. I hope that uh, you will come back to many forums that the Law and Religion Center has in years to come. Uh, this, I believe, is our final public forum for the spring semester. Um, would you please join me in a final round of applause thanking Professor Waltersdorf. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.